our moderator for the panel, Dave Tuttle. It's one of my colleagues at the Energy Institute. So welcome, Dave. Going. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a distinguished panel here of experts. Our panel today is distributed energy sources in the grid. So we're going to explain first what DER is at a, at a high level. So let me introduce my panel. First, to my left, your right, is Drew Higgins. He's the Senior Director, Products and Services at CPS Energy in San Antonio. Welcome. Thank you again for coming. Lisa Martin. Vice President, Electric Systems Engineering and Technical Services of Austin Energy, our local muni here. And Britton Smith, Senior Vice President, Electrification and Chief Strategy Officer of Bluebird Corporation. And thank all of you for coming. Um, it would take a quarter of the session to go through their impressive resumes and backgrounds. I'd, I'd recommend that you go do that at energyweek.utexas.edu under speakers if you want to look more. So let's start off first before we go through the presentations and just elevate the conversation and make sure everyone understands what are DERS, distributed energy resources, in each of your views. Okay, so um, just a little background. Um, CPS Energy is the local utility in San Antonio, the largest utility, uh, gas and electric utility, publicly owned in the United States. Um, and, and what I want you to know about distributed energy resources is you've already probably used them. Just think of a distributed energy resource as any aggregated energy that does not necessarily originate in terms of generation from the utility. So if, for example, um, there is a battery connected with a gas generator connected with solar, all three of those become part of an aggregated distributed energy resource network. And so two parts, right? There's what the utility produces at utility scale. And then there's DERS, which is what I like to consider a uh, small commercial residential scale. And uh, I hope that kind of kind of sets the stage. Lisa, can she, she's smarter than me. She can, she can lay it out better. Yeah, I will um, just add a little bit to what, I like the way you started that off. I'll add that um, at Austin Energy, we consider distributed energy resources resources that are smaller than 10 megawatts. Um, and they really can be solar, battery storage, uh, electric vehicles. Uh, sometimes, a couple, several years ago, we had a debate about whether or not uh, demand response, so smart thermostats or smart water heaters. I, I would put myself in the camp of yes. Anything that is uh, not coming from your centralized power plant um, on one end of your uh, electric grid, uh, anything that's distributed amongst your electric grid and either produces or consumes energy that you can have some amount of monitoring and control over to me is a distributed resource. And uh, I think that the, in addition to the, um, to the debate that we had several years ago about demand response, we also debated about electric vehicles. And so I don't mean to set you up for that, but hopefully that's uh, yeah, a good Yeah, I would solid. say electric vehicles are obviously a big part of distributed energy resources. And I'd say you know, was, I think the, the best for folks who have seen the Ford F-150 Lightning commercial, right, where it powers the house, I think that's the best example of it. Um, that's more vehicle to building versus vehicle to grid, but it's kind of that analogy, right? So you're sending energy back to a local resource, whatever needs it. Yeah, and so let me give some macro backup. So uh, for over 120 years, we've had um, electricity be affordable and reliable, ever more reliable over time by scale economies. And that's centralized larger scale. Your nuclear power plants are at the extreme of you know, gigawatts and gigawatts. But that over time drove down the price of electricity. These are distributed resources. And so classically it's been huge centralized resources through large and expensive transmission systems that were very capable and fairly efficient and then go into your house or your commercial or industrial load. Here we're talking about augmenting that. I don't think that that centralized grid is ever gonna go away. It's a fundamental backbone, but augmenting and having it complementary where you have these distributed resources and they can be consumers, producers, some people call those prosumers. So think about if you're into IT, you know, edge devices that can be either intelligent loads or actually putting back on the grid such not. So there's another way to look at it. 
So why don't we start with the presentation? So we have slides from each one of our, Drew first, who's already up, and then Lisa and Britton, and then we'll have questions. All right, so um, I'm gonna start off with, with giving a, I'm not gonna call it a history lesson, but it's kind of important to understand um, where we were, come from in terms of utility. And that's the perspective that, that I hope you get from this kind of the utility perspective, because that's what impacts you, right? And so, uh, you know, my background, I, I, I was in the Marine Corps, I was in aviation, um, got out of that, went to USAA, did that for a while, went to General Motors, was an automobile manufacturing, and somehow found my way to the utility sale, right? Basically a guy who can't figure out what he wants to do in his life, which is fine, right? Because I think I landed in a great place, but I got into the utility sector about five years ago. And even since then it's changed dramatically, right? So five years ago, when I got there, we'd look at a weather forecast. And what we do is we'd say, okay, based upon the weather forecast, what type of loads can we expect? What will people turn their thermostats, right? What's gonna be the driving behavior? what time of, you know, is it daylight savings for lights, things like that, manufacturing. And so we forecast load and then we dispatch generation. We figure out what plants we want to bring online, when, how, and where. Where we are today is we are now forecasting a little, I mean, we're forecasting a little bit of the load because it's renewables and as more renewables come online, we forecast more and more about where the wind is blowing, how sunny of a day it's going to be. But Different from what we did in the past is we now dispatch um, basically low. And what I mean by that is demand response. If it's a hot day, we may turn your thermostat down a little bit across the entire area to reduce kind of the load on the grid. Now take that into the future where almost all of our generation will be forecasted right, as we almost have all renewables and we have only a small piece of dispatchable base load generation. And then our load will be nearly completely dispatchable. We'll have buses that are waiting in a parking lot, waiting on the signal to come and release energy back to the grid. We'll have power walls that are just holding on the energy and waiting for those high prices. We'll have thermostats that are ready to shift and they'll even pre-cool a home knowing that in a little while that they're gonna get a signal to dispatch. And, and the one thing, you know, I should probably put under this entire slide is where the customer sits, which is kind of your perspective. Back in the day when utilities first kind of gained prominence, uh, there wasn't a lot of customer choice. We called you guys ratepayers, right? You were just ratepayers. After descent, you know, after, you know, in the 80s, after basically the Texas uh, opened up to competition, we started calling our ratepayers customers and we treated you a lot better because you had choice but in the future customers are going to be partners and, and that's really what i want to take the discussion right and so advantages of the new 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 grid structure include include greater efficiency resiliency lower cost uh, scalability equity uh, reliability and environmental environmental impact and this is critically important because if you look at the seven most important things to a utility in terms of what a boardroom thinks about. It's those seven things. And ADERs impact all seven, right? And so let's kind of look at, at where we are in terms of risk and friction, right? So um, near-term uh, supply chain and regulation are gonna be the, the biggest impacts, right? Switch gear, uh, I don't wanna get too technical, but basically we are recovering from an environment that was already bad in terms of supply chain. And so in order to put in a new transformer at a, uh, you know, for a, I guess you could say like a, uh, a EV charging station, you're looking at two years, maybe three years. And so we haven't even gotten into the place where we're ready to start implementing a large scale uh, vehicle to grid. Um, in the midterm, um, obviously digitalization, uh, renewable resources, more have to come online. Um, and we have to get over a regulatory dependence on fossil fuels uh, at large. And then extreme weather events as they increase, uh, that's going to be one of those you know, things that can really impact uh, how we, we implement ADERs. And then the long-term is obviously, these are all highly technical. So just to give you one more bit of kind of history of the utility, we have this thing called SCADA. 
And this thing is, is, a, is equivalent to uh, a, a closed box internet system that only allows the utility to communicate with its assets. And it's super secure and super safe and no one can get in. And we've kept it like that for years to the point where when I first came to the utility, I almost cried as I saw our tech stack was like 30 years old, strictly because of the zero risk mentality. ADRs, by their very nature of being distributed, they add a lot of digital risk because they exist for the most part outside of SCADA systems. And then finally, uh, the, the long-term risk and friction is around profitability. I will say in the short term, ADERs are great for profitability, but you have a lot of producers who are gonna be losing out on a lot of money, uh, mainly in the oil and gas industry in terms of, of shutting down uh, many of our gas generating plants. If you look at, and we can talk about this later, I won't you know, drone on too much longer, but California as a case study, you can see that the impacts of ADRs on, on kind of the financial models of utilities. And with that, I wanna turn it over to a colleague of mine who, who I think is amazing, Lisa Martin from Austin Energy. And if you have a problem, she says she can fix all of your Austin Energy. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thanks, Drew. So I think Drew is assuming that all of you are local Austin Energy customers. For those of you that are visiting UT Energy Week this week, um, Austin Energy is the uh, public power utility for the city of Austin. We are part of the city of Austin. And um, one of the benefits of being public power is that we really are community driven. And so we have all these different departments um, that include right the wire side, which is what I'm part of, um, but also we have generation. And then we have customer programs from energy efficiency, demand response, electric vehicles, emerging technology. It's all part of the portfolio of, of services that we provide to our customers. And yes, we do call them customers. Uh, Drew's absolutely right there. Uh, so I'm Lisa Martin, and I'm the Vice President of Electric System Engineering and Technical Services. And you know, one thing about DERs, well, in a former role, I was the program manager of DER integration at Austin Energy. And so that really that role really complements some of our programs in um, emerging technologies where they're developing programs for customers to say, what can we do to incentivize you um, or help you with what you would like in terms of solar on your roof, electric vehicle in your in your um, in your in your garage. And um, DER integration is really about studying the means and methods to enable more and more of that technology on our grid to really understand the impacts that it has. Um, Drew called some of them frictions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about you know some of the more technical impacts of what DERs can have on the grid. So I don't mean to uh, be a downer in this kind of sense, but the fact is is that if you don't know what you're up against, then you're not going to be prepared when you are ready to add that type of um, uh, resource to the grid. So I'll start with just a couple of slides um, to kind of paint the picture of the growth of this area. And I'll just start with some EV adoption rates. Um, it, it may be a little bit hard to see on this, but the y-axis here is total monthly re registrations. I got this graph from our electric vehicles team. I'm, I'm almost certain this is literally looking at the city of Austin um, from 2011 to 2022. Um, and the really reason I say almost certain is because uh, the yellow here is the Tesla Model 3 and then the orange that you start to see come into play, the bright orange in the bottom, um, is the Tesla Model Y, which is what they make in the Gigafactory just down the street. Um, and so this, you could see monthly adoption rates back in 2011 were maybe a dozen, um, and now we're upwards of seven over 700 um, EVs. And auto manufacturers are set to introduce almost 100 new EV models by 2024. Um, and right now, EVs, when they're charging, they just look like load. But as Britton spoke about, and as he will, he will talk a little bit more about, um, there is obviously a future for uh, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, vehicle to whatever. But as we talked in the very intro, there's many different types of distributed energy resources. And I was um, able to be the project manager for a, a grant funded uh, project several years ago um, from the Department of Energy uh, that part, we partnered um, as Austin Energy on a project called Austin Shines. SHINES is an acronym that stands for Sustainable and Holistic Integration of Energy Storage and Solar PV. 
it's quite a mouthful. If you've ever done any DOE work, you know there's always a ton of long acronyms there. But uh, just imagine, it was about solar and storage um, and holistically controlling them. And one thing that Drew said early on was that DERs are anything that's part of the consumer, but there's also utility scale DER. And so with the Austin Shines project, we were pairing solar and, and storage at three levels along the utility value chain. So this infographic um, describes the type of assets we put out there on our grid, and then uh, you know, through, from design to development to deployment. And so we had two uh, grid scale battery storage systems and then a grid scale uh, community solar farm. We had some battery storage at a commercial facility where the algorithms were focused on reducing the customer's demand um, to reduce their demand charge, so customer benefit. Um, and then we also did a bunch of work at the residential level, um, smart inverters on rooftop solar to control that solar. Um, we also put in residential battery storage um, also that we controlled and we also did vehicle to grid um, in one pilot as well. The heart of the system was a DER management platform or a DERMS, a DER management system, which um, put together a bunch of different algorithms to value stack both economic reliability and customer driven value streams to see how could we use these resources to get something for everybody based on what the scenario was on the grid, what the market was telling us, what the use case was at a particular location. So this was a great deep dive into DER um, and DER integration. We learned a lot of things during it. And uh, in the grand scheme of things, Shines didn't put enough DER on our grid to really realize all these impacts. We're continuing to study what will happen as the growth rates continue. Um, but some of the potential impacts are those that you see on the screen here. So the first is called unintentional islanding, and that may be something you're very familiar with, but just in case there's someone in the audience who doesn't know, I'm gonna start. So the key word here is unintentional. When I mean, when we say island, we're talking about a distributed resource that is serving a load and it's doing so, usually we call that like a microgrid, and that's a good thing, but that's an intentional island. This is a situation where you have a distributed resource that's connected in part with the grid and serving the load in parallel with the rest of the grid. And then part of the grid goes down and the distributed resource is also supposed to go down because if it doesn't, um, then you might be having unintentionally uh, energized equipment that could cause a safety hazard both to the public and the crews that are working to repair the grid. And so uh, again, intentional islands are good. Um, they are intentional, but unintentional islands are certainly not as happy as that little icon up there. Um, in terms of voltage regulation and equipment loading, uh, when we talk about distributed resources, often we talk about solar. And as you imagine, solar intermittent with clouds coming and going, and that cannot create uh, impacts to the voltage that you're expecting at your point of service. And there are fairly strict standards, uh, plus or minus 5% that your voltage is supposed to be at when you receive it. At your home, if you don't get voltage within that range, you might see some flicker in your lights, something like that. But if you are a heavy industry uh, semiconductor, <clears throat> you're a manufacturer of some sort, you're gonna be very sensitive to those kinds of um, fluctuations and you're gonna spend a lot of money to uh, make sure that you have regulation to protect yourself from those fluctuations. Um, but we have to make sure that voltage stays within limits so that we can serve all of our customers with the appropriate service that they're expecting. The other thing is that DERs can um, mask loads and so mask loads, I mean, they're basically serving them. But if the, grid, if the control center who's monitoring the grid doesn't know that that load's out there, um, if for some reason the distributed resource trips offline, now all of a sudden you have a surge in load, it's not that big of a deal if it's just a little bit, but if we have a substantial amount of distributed resources across our system serving load, and then they trip offline for some particular reason, there can be imbalances in the um, equipment, I'm sorry, imbalances in the grid and can put wear and tear, additional wear and tear on the equipment. And again, maybe not a problem initially, but over time uh, to compensate for that, that's more wear and tear on the regulation devices, the protection devices, which ultimately leads to dollars. And then um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about the grid was, was created for one-way power flow, um, power uh, generation on one side, transmission, substation, distribution, and then the consumer. Um, but now we're talking about putting distributed resources throughout the grid, which means power is flowing in many different ways 
um, on different aspects of that grid. And some of our protection, protection systems, specifically the relays, which are built to sense when there's an anomaly on the grid, a fault, and operate to isolate and prevent that fault from continuing to feed current, which can damage equipment and also create an unsafe space for, for um, people and crews. Um, those protection systems have to be set in a different way. So one, that they're looking towards the direction of the fault, but also that they can measure the current of that fault in the appropriate ways so that they know when to react. And so the real story of all of this is that the grid was built for one-way power flow. And when you add in all these distributed resources, they create, depending on how you're using them, they create different impacts in different places that you kind of have to monitor all at once. And so monitoring and controlling really is the name of the game, but it's costly and it's complicated. So I really like this uh, table that comes from IEEE and EPRI. And it really starts to speak to when do you have to start caring about the type of DERs and the amount of it on your grid. And so in a lot of places, in many parts of Austin, we're in this first column where our uh, DER penetration levels are less than 5%. And at that point, the whole integration objective is for them to be compatible and non-interfering. But as you start to get higher and higher penetration levels, that mid range is five to 30%. You really have to take into account what the local distribution impacts are. Some of the items I just spoke at at length on the last slide um, and, and make sure that you have the ability to monitor and act to mitigate when those start to cause problems for your customers. Um, when you get higher than that, greater than 30% penetration, now they're part of your life. The DERs and, and they, they have great benefits. We want them to be there. But the fact is, is that they're probably serving a substantial amount of the load on your grid. And without them, you have a major problem because you're depending on them. You don't have something else. You either have to have something else ready to ramp up right away, or you have to make sure that they're there consistently. You've got to be able to monitor and control them. And that takes a sophistication of a derm system. Uh, Drew talked about SCADA systems. SCADA, DERMS is a SCADA system. And uh, that is a technology that I've studied a fair bit about. And a lot of people talk about, we've got this DERM system, we've got that DERM system. They're still evolving in many, many ways. But that's what will enable us to have virtual power plants, aggregated distributed resources to really monetize these in the market, to really um, control them and make sure that they don't have the negative impacts on the grid. So right now, um, how do we study uh, DERs when, when a customer uh, wants to install them on our grid? Uh, it really depends. Um, so the feasibility and impact studies and the, the information you see up here is usually at Austin Energy, we start to do the study if your system is a megawatt or higher. So that's a pretty big uh, rooftop solar array. Um, uh, and again, this goes up to, in our world, 10 megawatts. Um, but if it's greater than 500 kilowatts or so half a megawatt, then we are talking that we'll basically do a hosting capacity study to see if there's a feasibility, we have enough capacity on that part of the grid to host that particular system. Anything that you're putting on your, on your roof or at your home that's smaller than that, we're really just checking to see if the transformer that serves your um, business or your home is size large enough to uh, you know, allow for the power flow um, through that transformer. And so um, these types of studies that we're doing are for really for the larger DER. And when we're doing that, again, we're checking voltage, we're checking our regulation devices like our tap changers, we're checking to make sure there aren't overloads, we're making sure that there's not gonna be impacts to large, expensive, and long lead time equipment like our transformers. Which, what I worry about, um, as much as I love DER, and I, I have two electric vehicles in my family, um, and my husband really wants to put root, uh, solar on our rooftop. And I said, you gotta, we gotta wait till we repair the roof first, put a new roof on. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that all these smaller DERs that we, you know, you don't know where they're gonna go or when they're gonna go. Um, a former colleague of mine used to call them cowboy DER because you don't have to necessarily register them. You just you put them on your house. Um, there are certain <coughs> paths to register them now. Um, in aggregate can have impacts that we just spoke about. And um, do we have the monitoring capability that the customers want us to monitor it? Are they concerned about us having information about their data on there? There's, there's all kinds of um, complications that come into play here. 
So just last slide as an illustrative point, this is electric vehicle charging. So electric vehicles, I was, I was talking to my team, DER integration, and they started talking about all these studies we do. And I said, yeah, but what about for a fast charger? And they said, well, a fast charger is load. We're just pulling from the grid. We're not putting on the grid. So we don't study that. Well, we do study those to make sure that they can go across the transformer. And I said, well, wait, 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 hold on a second. It really depends on what kind of electric charging we're talking about. And, and you don't really have to know anything about kilowatts um, or charging to really understand the point that I'm trying to make here. But there's lots of different ways you can charge your electric vehicle. The first is through a standard 120 volt receptacle, the kind that you use to turn, plug in your lamp or your toaster. And it will draw one kilowatt and it will do it for a consistent amount of time. This is eight to 12 hours. If I'm starting from, from you know, an empty tank, if you will, um, an empty battery, I should say, it can take you know, 12 to 16 hours. Um, uh, level two, these are the types of charging stations you ch generally see around town. This is the kind that I have at my house. It connects at 240 volts, which might be what your dryer connects at. And it can charge six to eight uh, hours. It says two to four up here, um, but six kilowatts. So not huge numbers. And again, for a somewhat significant amount of time. So it's kind of a constant load. When we talk about DC fast charging, they come in all different sizes. Um, some of them as large as 600 kilowatts. So now we're going from a one kilowatt load to a 300 kilowatt load. The magnitude there is really what you gotta pay attention to. And the fact that they're short bursts. So coming and going and coming and going that charge on your system. Um, and just for a matter of perspective, uh, homes are pretty energy efficient these days. And in Austin, the average home uses 860 kilowatt hours in it a month. A 300 kilowatt DC fast charger, you, if they take 20 minutes to charge a car, it just takes three cars back to back, for an, which would take an hour. And you've got 300 kilowatts, kilowatt hours, right? So that's a third of what a, a home takes on average for a whole month. So it's a fairly significant draw. And again, it's coming and going and coming and going. So that type of complexity um, really kind of underscores the need for making sure we understand the capabilities of DER, we understand their benefits so we can truly extract them, but that we're monitoring so we can also prevent any negative impacts to the grid. And so now I'm gonna pass it off to Britton to uh, talk to you about some really cool technology. So I was going to uh, actually leave up this last slide because this is a fantastic segue. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, my slides are not as good as hers, but uh, I will. So this is, this is actually very important. So uh, I guess maybe to start off with, so my name is Britton Smith. I'm the Senior Vice President of Electrification at Bluebird, which is a school bus manufacturer. So I'll talk about what that is. And so you might be asking, why is an OEM for a school bus manufacturer? Well, Elon said he couldn't come. so. <laughs> but you know, in all honesty, there, you know, there's actually really exciting opportunity, and you know, the the where we are in school bus electrification is, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting transition that we're going through. So, I'll start off maybe just to talk a little bit about Bluebird itself for folks who don't know. You probably have ridden on one uh, when you were a child, and maybe one of your kids rides on a school bus, but. Uh, Bluebird is a 95 year old company. Uh, we were founded in 1927 in Fort Valley, Georgia, which is still where we manufacture today. So very old company. Interestingly, our first, uh, it's not on here, but our first school bus was manufactured on a model, a Ford Model T chassis. A guy came to Albert Luce and said, hey, you know, we think you can build a, a better, better school bus body. And he did, he, he built it with steel, so it lasted longer. And then in, in the early um, 40s, we launched a Type D, which is kind of the one that looks like a transit bus, all steel, so safer. So we have this um, real uh, history on innovation. And you can see also, you know, these kind of first, uh, we we're also first to market with all of these. So compressed natural gas, uh, propane, and then electric. Our first electric, as you can see, was 1994 for the Atlanta Olympic Games, interestingly. So it was a couple of demonstration vehicles. Um, so we have really led the way in alternative fuels and the, the school bus industry in general, maybe I'll kind of step back a second. When you think about the school bus industry, it is a very unique North America proposition. So for folks who have traveled outside North America, you don't see yellow school buses anywhere, right? And when I lived overseas, I was surprised I had to pay somebody to take my kids to school every day. A little bit crazy, right? But in the US, 
it is a, you know, it, it's almost a right, right? So you don't see, folks have asked me, hey, what happened during COVID, distance learning? Uh, well, I think everyone knows how that experiment turned out and all those kids are back to school, right? So you haven't seen a shift, a, a big shift away from being in school and same type of thing, transportation really hasn't gone down over time. So student transportation in general tracks with, uh, with population uh, growth. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a it's, a, it's an interesting industry. Bluebird is one of really three manufacturers for these school buses. So us, Thomas, uh, Thomas built buses and then International. So it's really only three manufacturers and it's a relatively steady industry over time. Uh, we are the leader in alternative powered school buses. So 20,000 deployed. Most of those are propane, probably, you know, uh, 15,000, 16,000 are, are propane. And we've got a thousand electric vehicles on the road today. So I, actually, I wasn't supposed to tell you that. We have a big reveal coming out next month. There's going to be a big press release, so don't tell anybody. But <laughs> thousand, thousand EVs on the road, which is, which is pretty exciting progress. Um, so maybe just to talk about the electrification opportunity for school buses themselves. So there's over a half a million school buses on the road. And so when you think about you know, what those are, about 90% of them are diesel. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a reason for that. I mean, it's a, it's a safety thing, but it's also a, a durability, right? These school buses, um, they're required to uh, last for a school district from anywhere between 10 to 20 years, depending on the state. It's mandated by the state when they have to come off the road, right? And then they go, uh, I don't know, transport people for canoe rides or something. There's a lot of stuff that they go do. But you know, the, for, for school districts, you see that there's a, there's a real time frame that they need to be used. Uh, half a million buses, trans, you know, transporting kids every day. If we converted them all to electricity, to electric, that'd be 5 million tons of carbon emissions. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity uh, and 100 gigawatts of stored energy potential. So you know, I, I, obviously at a 1C rate, that's 100 gigawatts, it's pretty, pretty significant. So why is electrification of school buses um, possible? Why is it exciting? So if you think about the use case for a school, it's, it's kind of perfect. Our school bus only has 155 kilowatt hours. So think about this, it is a 33,000 pound vehicle uh, with 155 kilowatt hours. Compare that to a Hummer, uh, electric Hummer, which has about the same battery pack, right? And it's, it's carting around, you know, two people, maybe, maybe four or five people, right? This has, anywhere from 60 to 70 kids going back and forth to school every day. The reason is, is it's a short route, right? In the morning, they go 30 miles. In the afternoon, they go 30 miles. They sit during the middle of the day where they can recharge. They come back to the same place at night where they can recharge. So it's this fantastic use case for electric uh, that you don't see anywhere else. And even last mile delivery, there's a lot of excitement around last mile delivery for electric vehicles. A lot of those vehicles go out, they might have 100, even up to 150 or 200 mile route during the day, and they don't come back, right? So it's a it's a bit of a it's a it's a more difficult use case. Um, the other the other kind of great piece about it is they always come back to the same place, right? So you don't need it's not like a, a class eight truck. Everyone's excited about you know transforming this these diesel big heavy diesel trucks that are on the road. Well, you know school buses don't go on these long routes. Obviously there are some you know, some, some uh, school trips maybe that you might need a, a bit more range, but in general, you're coming back to the same place, you're charging in the same place, right? So you can install a charger at your home. Those chargers that we were looking at, most of our customers actually only install level two chargers, right? Um, you know, and, the, and the, the reason is, is that 155 kilowatt hour battery, you can charge it overnight, you're good to go by the next day, in the middle of the day, you can top it up. So it's a great opportunity and it's a perfect fit for electrification. So. Where are we today? So I mentioned Bluebird has a thousand EVs on the road, which sounds fantastic. Um, there's about a thousand more from other from our competitors, so about two thousand electric. So that's was that 0.4 percent penetration. It's not a lot, but think about this. Uh, so in last year there were about a thousand EVs sold out of thirty thousand total in the market. It was really less, a little bit less than that, but so around three percent. Now there's so much federal funding coming down the pipe. That, uh, that we're actually going up this year. So for folks who don't know, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act has $5 billion over five years. So about a billion dollars, well, it's a billion dollars a year. That funded 2,500 buses. So we went from 1,000 to 3,500 buses per year uh, starting this year. So now what you're gonna see is penetration is around 13%, 13 to 15%. So think about if in uh, passenger cars, we were at 13% penetration for electric vehicles, right? It would be a seismic shift. 
right? I think we're in single, I don't know, single, number, single digits or so, right? So significantly higher penetration, again, driven by funding. Now, what, is the, what does the funding mean? Well, I'll give you some of the statistics. A diesel engine uh, school bus costs around $120,000. Uh, an electric school bus, $375,000, right? So it's a lot more. That's a problem. So, you know, the, and so these, this is one of the challenges that I wanna highlight. Uh, so it's not, all, it's not all roses and sunshine uh, on the electrification of school buses or in V to G, right? So we talked about the different chargers and I appreciate you doing that because so this is an example, we work with Nuvi. Uh, for folks who don't know, they do vehicle to grid software that connects into the utility, very, you know, kind of cutting edge technology that they have. But one of those chargers, so think about it this way, uh, you know, this kind of had this example of, hey, you, you plug in a vehicle, you plug in the next vehicle. Well, that's not how it works for school buses. Obviously you don't, in the middle of the night, have somebody come to the yard and change. Uh, you have one charger per bus in general. You could have a two, two port, right? So multiple buses per, Per charger but in general it's one charger per bus and in general they, they'll only buy a level two because it's a couple thousand dollars these uh v to g chargers cost sixty thousand dollars they're 60 um uh, 60 kilowatt chargers so they're not super high end right they're not like a, a transit bus uh, that might need a 300 kilowatt charger so it's only 60 kilowatts but it's sixty thousand dollars so now uh for on a per bus basis it goes from two thousand to sixty thousand dollars that's significant for a regular DC fast charger, you're talking 20 to 30,000. So think about it this way. If you go from level two, 2000, to DC fast charge, 20 to 30, then all the way up to V to G. So if you wanna send energy back to the grid, now you're talking about $60,000. Doesn't sound like a lot, but think about every school district that you know, you know, they're, they're struggling to buy pens and paper and you know, stuff for their kids. When you talk about spending an extra $30,000, extra $40,000 per bus, not to mention spending an extra couple of hundred thousand dollars per bus, right? That becomes a real barrier that needs to be overcome. Um, on the right-hand side, highlight some other things that, uh, you know, challenges. And I think this is one of the, one of the big, it's interesting, I was having this conversation earlier today, this question between bond fund and operating fund, you know, the question is always, hey, what about TCO, right? Isn't it better, to, isn't it cheaper to operate an electric school bus versus diesel? Of course. You know, so a, a, an electric school bus costs around 14 cents a mile versus diesel costs 49 cents a mile. So it's three times the cost. Now, the problem is a couple of folds. So one, you know, you don't recuperate that large upfront cost, but also those pools of fund are separate, right? It's not like a business where I can reallocate funds to a capital cost and then recapture that total cost, right? Here, a school needs to raise funds. They need to raise bond funds to fund that really expensive bus, which they don't want to do. They don't want to go ask their taxpayers for more money for an expensive bus, right? And same type of thing with operating funds. Those are steady every year, right? So if those go up or if those go down, it's actually, it, it could be not beneficial for them to, to, to cut costs there. Same type of thing, transportation director and facilities director. So if you think about um, if a transportation director has a certain amount of funding for diesel fuel, but then all of a sudden that gets moved over to the uh, facilities director who's in charge of electricity at the site. He's not gonna be too happy, right? So that there's, there's this constant interplay between where the funds get allocated. And then tried and true versus new technology. This is a really big barrier. And I, you know, I think you know, we, I, I had some conversations today about you know, red states versus blue states. And I've 100% seen that where it's been politicized, the adoption of EVs. But even bigger is when you tell a facility or a a transportation director, a guy who drove a diesel bus, and then he maintained the diesel bus, and then he has a fleet of 50 diesel buses, and, he's, and, and you go and say, hey, we want you to take on electric. This is no way, right? So it's a huge barrier for them to overcome when they, all they've done their whole lives is, is maintained, operated, um, you know, and, and used those very, very reliable diesel buses. Um, EVs are, by the way, number one, just as reliable, if not more, they have better performance. For anyone who's driven an EV, you guys understand this, right? And actually, we have a case study coming out. There's all like Colorado, there's all these worries about driving through the mountains. And uh, in, in, interestingly, the school driver, the bus driver who drives the EV says, yeah, I'm the one who goes on the toughest route because it's an EV, it's heavier, it's very well planted in the snow. So it's a fantastic uh, use case where actually the new technology is better performance. So. I think last page I'll talk about is like, what do we need to do? How do we go you know, solve some of these problems? 
Um, the, the first question is how will EV funding model evolve, right? So I mentioned this, this significant cost differential, uh, you know, 375 versus, you know, 120, 125 is, is, a, is a big difference. Highland Electric is an example of a company who is changing the funding model from owning versus leasing. And so they're really recapturing that V to G opportunity. So what they do is they come into a school district and they say, look, you know, we want you to fully convert over to electric or convert a significant portion of your fleet. We'll put in place these charges for you. We'll maintain the charges for you. We'll make sure that your vehicle is topped up in the morning, ready to go. Uh, and all you have to do is pay us uh, the same amount that you would for operating costs for a diesel bus, right? So for a school district that wants to convert, it ends up converting that uh, cost uh, from, it basically equalizes out that operating versus uh, capital cost that we talked about. And it also, by the way, makes it even for, a, for, for any money flows. So Highland Electric is a great example of an opportunity to change that structure, right? So if you think about investing, um, there's a lot of companies talking about this and a lot of companies who are trying to figure out that financial structure and how they make it work. Um, the, the second piece is how will the cost base change? Obviously that's my job, right? How do I drive down the cost of, of electric vehicles? I think, you know, I always get asked like, what does that curve look like? Um, and, you know, the, the folks will talk about the cost of lithium, the, the, the cost of batteries, the cost of components. Unfortunately, you know, that's something that will hopefully go down over time, but we don't directly drive. So, and, and what I'll, I'd like to just differentiate between passenger cars and commercial vehicles for a minute, because uh, passenger cars, you see full vertical integration. And, you know, that's sort of how they drive that, right? They're doing their own battery factories, et cetera. Uh, on the commercial vehicle side, it's not the way at all. Uh, and, and the reality of it is, you know, everyone buys the same frame rails, everyone buys the same axles, everyone buys the same, um, you know, components for their vehicle, large components for the vehicle. And the same piece, same is true with electric vehicles. I don't have enough volume to open up my own factory. I'd like to, but it's not going to happen, right? So what we depend on is our tier ones and tier twos to really drive down that cost. My hope is, is that that uh, cost base continues to go down over time. And then the next five, six years, as federal funding and state funding goes down, we'll be able to, to get to a more equitable uh, price. The last question is what can utilities do? I think is most interesting. I didn't, I apologize. I didn't uh, put your logo there, but there's a reason. So <laughs> Dominion Energy, Dominion Energy, you know, we had a conversation with them. We've, we've been having conversations with them for you know, years, but uh, they have a very innovative model where they're pushing out uh, specifications on, okay, your battery needs to be this big. It needs to have a warranty this long. It, at the end of life, it needs to have this amount of stored energy available. And then not only that, but it, then within their territory, they're saying, hey, we're going to co-invest, right? So we'll fund a portion of that. And then when the bus's useful life is gone, then we want the bus. They don't really want the bus, they want the battery, right? So it's an interesting model where they're getting directly involved in the purchase of school buses within their territories. They're delineating who can and can't buy school buses and who they're gonna provide energy to. Uh, and they're doing that because they have a longer term view, right? All uh, school buses, or at least all Bluebird school buses come standard with V to G capability. Um, but unfortunately, I'll give you the reality, we have a thousand school buses on the road, a handful are doing V to G. And this includes everything from rate capping to really sending energy back to the grid. So because of all these barriers that we've already talked about, right? So it's the promise is there, the opportunity is there, but the question is how are we gonna solve all, all of those? And personally, really, I, you know, Dominion Energy I use is a great example because they're driving it directly, right? They're, they're thinking forward and how do they lead that conversation and lead the customer, um, the school district, uh, and hopefully you, know, you guys can all do the same. So thank you. Thank you all. Excellent comments and insights. Um, so we'll get some, some conversations going. So my first question, I'll sit down in a second after I get this back fixed up, is everything in the energy complex that I've noticed over the years has to do with its cost and scalability. And cheap tends to win. And so each one of your organizations has been involved in employing some aspect of, of DERs, whether it be V to G at a small scale or thermostats, et cetera. But can you start off maybe from Britain's end again, going this way and talk about what you've seen as far as the 
early adoption, what types of DERs, what's had positive payback today, and sort of a roadmap. What have you deployed today and what's economic today? Yeah, I mean, I'll start. And as I mentioned, there haven't been a ton of deployments uh, for, for V2G across the country, but those who have, you know, they're seeing anywhere from, uh, you know, $5,000 to $20,000 payback, right? And, and again, it obviously depends on the utility, it depends on the uh, cost of electricity, uh, but it can be significant, right? So if you think about a 10 year life of a bus, if you've got 5,000, that's 50,000, that's pretty significant. If you got 20,000 per year, of revenue that you're generating, it's 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 pretty significant. So there's there's real opportunities, and I think for us, you know, we're and we're excited about the opportunity. But you know, all these other costs need to get overcome somehow. So I think I don't know. Let's see how you guys think about it. Oh, and so just to make people aware, V to G means vehicle to grid, and so that's where you're actually taking the energy you stored in the electric vehicle and putting it back on the grid, reverse power flowing. Another. A term that that we use so much is TCO, total cost of ownership, and that's where you're looking at not only the upfront cost, but over the life of it, what's the total cost, and what's the internal rate of the internal rate of return or net present value as a total project for its life. Um, so yeah, I was going to say I'm, I was glad to hear your your stats about the um, vehicle to grid chargers um, because. When we were doing our pilot, you know, several years ago, um, with a Nissan Leaf and a, and a vehicle, to, it was as expensive to buy the the charging station that had V2G capability as it was to buy the Nissan Leaf, and we had a really hard time even getting them. Uh, a lot of the ones that were offered were at 50 hertz and really meant for Europe, um, and and I didn't know how much things had changed. Um, and also, at the time, there was a barrier because you weren't allowed to put power back onto the grid um, from or take power from your electric vehicle without voiding the warranty, but Nissan was, permit, was uh, you know, changed to allow that to happen. And I would imagine others are, are in that process of changing as well. That's not your question. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I think I wanna answer from the perspective of battery storage. Um, you know, the, the prices of lithium ion batteries were really high when we were doing this, this project in the 2015 to 2020 timeframe. And one thing that we were really trying to figure out was if we could um, uh, value stack all these different um, you wanna, use cases. I'm gonna keep inserting jargon, value stack. You wanna value it. stack, yeah. So, so I talked a little about um, making you know, money, extracting value from the, the energy market or um, extracting value in terms of reliability and also value for the customer. And if we can um, create algorithms that use these distributed resources at different times for different purposes, we could maybe stack one value on top of the other and then say that we could get a payback of some sort. And um, what we found is that it just is still complicated and in its nascent stage. And so we ultimately, at one point in time, and this isn't very large, but at one point in time, we had a goal of putting 10 megawatts of battery, of utility scale battery storage um, system on our distribution grid. And with Shines, we put just over three megawatts and everyone thought, okay, where's the next seven megawatts going? And the outcome of that study, and it's all written up in the white papers, was that the value isn't there yet. And so we should, you know, the payback isn't there yet. There's still more that has to be done in terms of communications, you know, driving particular costs down and um, continue the sophistication of the algorithms and the control. So one of the most popular DERs you have is, isn't it Power Partners Thermostats? We do have Power Partners Thermostats, yes. So you that's want to explain what power partners thermostats are and how that's a DER and how that, that benefits the utility and customers. Yeah. So so power partners thermostat is essentially our, our legacy thermostat program where we had the ability to um, control a thermostat in your home uh, when power when the when the power prices are particularly high on the, on the peakiest, peakiest days. Um, and basically maybe a mega, I'm sorry. Uh, a degree or two. So not anything that's significant to really cause you to like start overheating in your home. And you always have the option to opt out by just going up to your thermostat and putting it back down to where you want. But a lot of times people aren't, don't need to, to, to opt out. Um, and so by doing that, I think we had um, at one point in time, 90 megawatts on our power partner thermostat program. Now we use the Nest and the Ecobees and all those others. And so it's a, it's a more sophisticated program um, but uh, up to 90 megawatts of, of load or demand response. 
And at the highest point in time, really that would benefit us in terms of our 4CP, which is really okay, technical jargon. <laughs> you want me to go there? Yeah. So essentially that 4CP stands for four coincident peak. And essentially when ERCOT, which is the uh, essentially grid operator, um, uh, when they have the highest load across the entire region, they check to see how much of all of the load servant entities, what our share of that load is. And then that ultimately defines what our share of the costs are for operating certain parts of the grid. So essentially, simply by reducing your load when ERCOT's at a peak, when the whole system's at a peak, then you basically are paying, you're having cost savings there. And that, that's a pretty significant driver in cost savings. Mm -hmm. um, when we were doing the battery storage, we were also trying to deploy it during the four CP times. You have to predict when those are, which is not an easy thing to do. And, um, and that was by far the highest driver of value in that stack. Of the so peak shading, peak shading was one of the, the biggest value yeah. stack. Okay, Drew, what do you do at CPS? Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm gonna brag because we have the largest demand response program in Texas, 270 megawatts of demand response, um, probably 150 of that strictly in thermostats and commercial, some other things in there, including EV charging, managed charging, where if you are charging your EV um, and we will pay you money to let us control your charger and derate it, right? Take it down from, you know, uh, whatever, basically reduce it by about 50 to 60%. Um, and this is critical. So going back to just have a discussion on peak, uh, the most kind of expensive, and I will just use the S word, stupid part of utilities is we build to the maximum load possible. And the last 20% of that load rarely ever shows up, right? And so that's the most expensive part. There's whole, there's a whole industry built around building gas turbines uh, to serve, they call them peaker plants to serve that extra 20%. And so anything you can do to reduce usage at that point is a big, big cost saver. And then on top of that, ERCOT decides to base their kind of spread of the money also on peak. So once again, that's at 4CP. And so by being able to reduce it on those peak, peakiest days, you can save a lot of money. And my program saved over $20 million over a two-day period. And we had price spikes, I guess it was four years ago, up to $9,000, right? And so by turning down thermostats, we saved about $20 million for our customers, right? And, and that's all part of kind of, you know, uh, distributed energy resources. It's the power of what they can do. Additional advantages of these, like we have a battery storage system that's inside of our distribution system. And that also saves uh, both in terms of, of, of just broadly, like having to supply energy to that area. It also reduces wear and tear in our distribution system. By having energy generator inside of the distribution system, you can fill in uh, basically uh, voltage gaps and things like that inside of the system without having to use outside, outside resources and very helpful. Um, and so when we look at, at um, I hate to use acronyms over and over again. ADERs in general, uh, you know, you can have these things called ancillary services. Um, and one of those, and I'll give you an example, is fast frequency responses. When there's a frequency uh, lag or frequency free, uh, gap, you can deploy batteries, and we do, um, to fill that up. And it's extremely valuable because it stops my lights from blowing out because I live in the, the hill country at the very edge of our service territory. If anyone in here, has our light bulbs go out, of, out all the time, like at a very high rate, it's probably because you have very poor frequency, right? Uh, you've all seen it. That is, I think, probably the number one indicator uh, where, where you have frequency issues. And so when you use that as an example, when you look at what DERs can do, if you place DERs in those areas, you can have the, the optionality in the future of making sure that you have a sustainment to get to make sure you have that 60 frequency hertz. And we do that in San Antonio with our, our 10 megawatt battery. Um, additionally, so we have batteries, we have uh, our DR system, we have our managed charging program. Uh, we also have one that's not as economic, I mean, uh, environmentally friendly, our Enchanted Rock program that we partner with HEB to do resiliency. And so as I spoke before, there are seven primary boardroom issues for every utility, right? Um, I'm not going to go over, I'll see if I can give them again, decarbonization, um, resiliency, um, equity, Workforce, 
um, regulatory and compliance. And there's two more in there, I forget, but the safety, safety and then, uh, oh, profit. Yeah, I that. <laughs> I make um, and so when you, when you look at Enchanted Rock um, and what they're doing with ATB, if the lights go out, um, the Enchanted Rock generators spin up and they keep the lights on in ATB. If HEBs, and everyone knows here and knows what HEB is, if HEB loses power for 20 minutes, it's a $400,000 loss. They have to throw away the food. That's it. And so they know that by putting these enchanted rock generators that'll turn on and spool up, that they could save a lot of money. However, resiliency is very expensive. And so they partner with us, and I think they're, they're partnering with you guys as well, that also on times like our 4CP that Lisa talked about, They'll spin up their generators and supply energy back to the grid. And what that, that'll do is the lights are already on in HEB, that's fine, but it, it provides additional generation in our area so that we can stop pulling energy from ERCOT. And so we also do, we also partner with these enchanted rock generators to provide uh, additional uh, DER service. I think that's about it. Can I, yeah. just one quick comment. So something, something Drew mentioned, so smart charging is, so important and so exciting for us. Uh, so as an OEM, you know, it's not just being able to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, you're not charging when the, the grid doesn't want you to charge, but it's also making sure the bus or the vehicle is ready to go in the morning. Uh, and cold climates is, this is a big deal, right? Because you want to be able to make sure it's preconditioned, the battery's up and running, everything's ready to go by the time you get going. And then, you know, so we, we work on you know, not just with our charger uh, manufacturers, but also charge management companies who their whole purpose in life is to do software that connects to the grid, that understands what the demand is going to look like, understands that you have 10 different EVs in, the, in, your, in your field that need to get charged at some point at night. So how do you balance all those out? So it's, it's a very exciting field. And I think it's something, there's a lot, a lot of good innovation going there. So excellent. So each one of you engage with other folks throughout the country pure utilities, you're selling them to all 50 states, I would imagine. Um, can, have you observed regional differences that are interesting in terms of DER deployment and economics? You know, Hawaii is very expensive in terms of electricity, California also. So things that could work there may not work here just from the penciling out, but how about some contrast to what we've seen in other regions where things work there, they don't work here or vice versa. Can I go first? Yeah. All right, so California, listen, folks, I, I am on the PUC's task force for the ADR. I'm the number three person, I guess, on this whole kind of shenanigan thing going on. And I went to California, they have a program called the Emergency Load Reduction Program, ELRP. And I met with Southern California Edison, I met with uh, PG&E, and I you know, spoke with SMUD. And let me tell you something, I copied and pasted extensively from that for our regulations. It is like, just use this, don't try to you know, make up a whole bunch of new stuff. And that's how we wrote out the general guideline. California is far and away ahead of where we are. Like I, I cannot say this enough. Um, there are issues with California, right? But directionally in terms of technology, they're just better than where we are. Um, and so when you look at the ELRP program and what they've done with the assistance heavily of Tesla, they are now at the point where Southern California Edison is ready to retire some of the peaker plants because they get so much value from individual premises, this, a premise is a home, individual premises with Tesla power walls that are willing, you know, at a price point to use those to support the grid. It's proven they've done it and they're going to and they're going to continue to do it now i whenever i speak to audiences i generally don't talk about the decarbonization side the environmental benefits there's a i had a professor john doggett i'm not sure if you guys know him. yeah yeah it's about profit folks right you got to make this stuff profitable and in the EL, elrp program they're paying their customers on average somewhere around 140 dollars per instance of use, which lowers the return on investment for that power wall from like never to like six years, right? And so this is gonna be a huge step change. We're gonna do the same thing in Texas, but if I wanna look anywhere across the globe, um, besides Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico has a different set, they're, they're ahead of us, but it's a different set of circumstances. 
I'm looking at California and what they're doing um, and seeing how I can adapt it for the, the ERCOT wholesale market. Yeah, and when Drew says ADER, and he says it like it's a word because he just throws all those letters together, <laughs> it's aggregated distributed energy resources, Sorry. which no, no, <laughs> and they probably all knew that. I just felt the need to, to be Dave for a moment. Um, and, and, and so that's essentially the same as what people also say VPP, a virtual power plant. It's taking all these distributed resources, pulling them, pull, pulling them together, and then uh, dispatching them with the capacity size or the you know the energy capacity output size of a larger generator. And um, I think that to Dave's question, um, where you know ADER is gonna work in ERCOT because there's a program specific to making that you know, enabled in this, there, there's going to be a way to monetize that. Um, and to your point about regional differences, um, I, I used to work in energy markets in California and there's a capacity market there, whereas here in, in ERCOT, it's just an energy and ancillary services market. And so, um, you know, whereas we're a lot of times we're building batteries that are generally- A capacity market is when they pay people <laughs> <laughs> to have a generation standing by and not being used. In Texas, we don't do that because we're Texas and we're not gonna pay you to not do anything. It doesn't happen. So I'm sorry. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, but in, in, in the, the rule in California is that you have to be available for at least four hours. And so battery storage systems are getting built that are for, you know, have the duration of at least four hours so that they can reap the, the capacity, um, the, you know, the cost, uh, sorry, benefit or value. And uh, when, when I was um, buying and selling, uh, you know, contracts for power, um, the the value of the capacity was was you know was high over the the value of energy and that was 12 or 13 years ago um and then you mentioned fast frequency response so ancillary services the ability for a, a battery um to just kind of produce and then stop and put, like that's really the the filling in the gaps to balance the supply demand um that has to be in constant balance and uh you know they have that they're, they're working on that here but they had you've had it for a while at pjm which is in um, northeast and other places so the way you can monetize a lot of these in the markets is really dependent on the uh, products that are available in the market mm -hmm. so maybe uh, just to start up so uh, a fact i forget to mention was so bluebird has deployed ev school buses to 35 states and four canadian provinces um the most are in California, <laughs> uh, but you know we we have point is you know we, we've gotten a lot of experience across the country. A, a case study I think that's interesting is Quebec. Uh, Quebec is 100% electric, uh, so you can't buy a diesel, or gas, propane, school bus in Quebec right now. Only electric. Um, zero of those uh, have V to G or even level three charging. Uh, they're all level two, and not just for cost, but also because of Hydro Quebec. Right, so all of their electricity is renewable and plentiful. So there is quite likely zero chance that they'll do DER there, really because of that fact. Again, that's a case study, but apply that across other areas. I mean, I live in Georgia. We have very cheap nuclear, mostly nuclear power. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, mostly coal, uh, but a lot of nuclear power as well. So really, you guys, well, I won't go into this. <laughs> anyway, point is, is the cost of electricity and availability of it is a really big driver in, in terms of how much this gets used. Hmm, thanks for the contrast. So this V to G concept, because these school buses are huge in terms of their battery storage, and it doesn't take that many school buses, city buses, semis to be electrified to create a huge set of batteries. And when you look at combining wind and solar and trying to ferment, ferment is a term where you make it dispatchable. It's dispatchable to say, as a natural gas plant or coal plant, right? The, the sheer volume of storage from these number of vehicles could be substantial, right? And so from my investigations in this over the, over the years, it's, it's very sort of sexy to talk about all our light duty vehicles being plugged in and have bi-directional charging and then used, but instead of, thousands and thousands of personal vehicles, if you had a hundred less, a hundred times less of those that are huge battery buses and such not, it can work. And so can you describe more your, your V to G pilots 
and now having them depot charge behind one meter, yeah. how that helps make the V to G economics attractive more early. Yeah, well, a couple of things I'll talk about. So one, uh, so school bus batteries, like I mentioned, really aren't that big. And, and sorry, I just want to be clear because if you think about like a semi, you know, a, 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 that might have 600 kilowatt hours, a, 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 a transit bus, so a city bus might have 800 kilowatt hours. So those buses, those batteries are enormous. The school bus is 150, 200 kilowatt hours. So, so relative to <laughs> give, give you guys an idea, kill, uh, a, a, a kilowatt hour, right? Let's, um, one, a 200, I mean, a 100, a one megawatt is enough in Texas to power 200 homes, right? So just to kind of give you an idea, one megawatt is 200 homes. 100 kilowatts is enough for 20 homes. And so when you, when you think of 100 kilowatt or 150 kilowatt hours enough to power 30 homes, just to give you a point of reference. So it is significant. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. 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 Yeah, but I, I, and, but I guess, you know, so it's, it is a good amount of storage, but it's not as much as like a semi. That being said, here's the really cool thing. You know, th there's a big, like, again, the, the, the great part about a school bus is that you plug it in and you leave it. When I say you, I mean, the, the transportation director and his, his team leave it overnight, right? So it is stuck and it is plugged in for forever. If you have a personal vehicle, you might plug it in, you might not. You know, if you have a, uh, a truck or, a, um, you know, a, a transit bus, you know, you're, you're picking up electricity wherever you can. Um, and it's, you don't have that kind of opportunity, right? It's, it's a the school. And the really fun thing to me is that school districts are a mobile source that follows the population, right? So think about, you know, whenever there's population growth, there's going to be new schools, there's going to be school buses there. So it's a perfect opportunity to really have that chase you know, whatever population demands are coming along. Well, let's see if we have some audience questions. Anik, do you want to raise your hand, please? Or you can go to that microphone there. Austin on D1, oh, sorry. That San Antonio is meeting Austin on V1G. Um, and I'm just wondering when, all of us, uh, the EV owners here in Austin, will be able to have the one G. So demand, um, you know, management on the charging of our vehicles at night. I, I really liked his idea of I'm charging at fifty percent or forty percent or sixty percent. You don't know, completely turn me off, um, and so I can probably get that vehicle charged in four hours, and I'm gonna, it's going to be parked for eight. So I'm, I'm totally set. I, I feel very confident letting Austin Energy control that. When will we have that? I know you have a tiny pilot right now, but we'd like yeah, to I, see it. I just want to make sure I understand your question. You're asking when we're going to pilot doing the uh, vehicle charging uh, response, demand response? Yes. Yeah. So that pilot is is getting started right away. Actually, if you received, as, as I did, a, a rebate when you, when you installed your electric vehicle charger at your house, then the agreement that you signed gave us the capability to control, You're already control on it. and communicate to it. <laughs> and it was really in terms of going back and making being the partnership to um, to actually right put that program in place. So there, the electric vehicles and emerging technologies team right now is is rolling out that that pilot now. That yes. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Putting on your founder hats for a second, where are the biggest opportunities and maybe tech gaps that you see in this, uh, this arena? All right. um, I'll, I'll go first. So we had a, we, we were cooking with the ADER task force. We're moving faster than any PUC program had ever done. And then we had our IT security discussions and everything kind of just came to a screeching halt. Um, the issues with ADERs is they exist kind of on the rails of, of SCADA systems. So anytime you have a, a, a queasy, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's like, I'm yeah. sorry, triple sorry, header. Sorry. So, so, so we have these entities called qualified scheduling entities that do the bids that go into the ERCOT market. Think of them as market makers, right? And so they send signals to our control rooms and our control rooms dispatch the generation. And so all most for the most part, all of that's handled through these very secure communication channels. Unfortunately, ADERs that are coming to market are, are very customer driven and they're at premise level, like your thermostats. They work through publicly through, through the public Wi-Fi system. 
And so there's an opportunity, a, what we call it a threat vector that a hacker could uh, essentially attack. And because of that threat ve vector, you know, we're, we are concerned that it can have a, 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 a impact on the overall grid stability. And if I could think of any one thing out there, it's not that the threat, because the threat's there, like we get hundreds of attacks every day. The real threat is how much of our reaction will, it, will we have uh, to try to mitigate that threat. Because the mitigation, the old adage, the, the medicine is worse than the disease. Uh, it could be a case of where it slows us down so much that we can't you know, make good use of this. But that is the number one for me. And SCADA systems, system control and data acquisition? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Supervisory control. Supervisory control. And data acquisition. Yeah. Basically a whole bunch of monitoring points out in your grid and they use SCADA systems and oil and water and everything else. If monitoring that, that gather data, bring it back to your central command and then also have the ability to go out and control various aspects. That's what SCADA is. And um, you're absolutely right. SCADA, we put in the... Um, category of OT, which is operations technology versus IT, which of course is information technology and the cybersecurity threat and, um, and, and, and mitigation there is huge just to make sure that we are ensuring the reliability of the grid. So anytime we're talking about grid edge devices and the, you know, not, not going off of our own networks like at Austin Energy, when our SCADA system is running completely on our, inter our internal uh, fiber network to all of our substations. And now if it's at your home and your home, and this lady in the back asked about, was it over Wi-Fi? Yeah, sometimes it's over Wi-Fi, sometimes it's over cellular. Cellular is really expensive when you're talking about that, that, you know, the monthly charge across all those different devices. We did some pilots where we were doing it over uh, radio frequency mesh or the advanced metering infrastructure um, network as well to try to figure out how are we communicating with these devices so we can get accurate and timely uh, information in and also send, send signals back. If you're trying to regulate voltage, it needs to be within seconds. If you're trying to send a dispatch signal to, you know, ramp up generation, it can be within, you know, minutes. It depends on what, what you're trying to accomplish. And um, the other big piece that um, we learned a lot, and I keep hearing all the standards groups talk about it, is that there doesn't seem to be a single standard communication standard for um, integrating uh, and monitoring and control of your, of your distributed resources. And so there's one standard for electric vehicles, there's a different standard um, for batteries, there's a different standard for solar, and we really need to um, solidify on, on a single or two. Like there's a reason why things are standardized, it'll help drive down the costs as well, and um, not create vendor lock-in um, interoperability is really key there, and that's a huge technology challenge. Yeah, so I think, you know, from a software perspective, you know, there's tons of opportunities, whether it's, you know, the intercompatibility and enabling, you know, different different components to work together, right? The IoT question, um, you know, there's, uh, there's also, I think, this smart management, smart charging management, where it, it's huge, there's a huge opportunity to think about AI and how do you make them smarter, right? So predictive charging um, and looking at, taking into account things like, you know, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? So is it going to be hot? Therefore, we need to charge up these batteries a little bit more and make sure that we have some extra, you know, ready to go. Uh, and then, you know, when you think about hardware side, I mean, obviously there's tons of, you know, innovative opportunities about thinking about overall site, uh, site load management, whether you're talking about a school district or an HEB in terms of, you know, integrating, you know, how the, the chillers versus the air HVAC versus the lighting and all that works together. Uh, and then, you know, just think about EVs in general, right? I mean, there's a ton of uh, innovative opportunities and how do you extend the life cycle of a battery, uh, you know, how the com components uh, associated with it. So, I mean, there, there's, it's a ripe area, huge, huge opportunity. Well, with that, thank you so much for sharing all your insights and your time for our expert panel.